Well, here we are, in Sydney at least, we're in lockdown. And we're all in our own homes, separated, and so church, of course, can't meet together in person. Well, what do you do when you can't meet together in person? Well, let's go back to the letter to the Ephesians in the New Testament that we're looking at at the moment over these coming weeks. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 we're up to, and Paul says, I'm in lockdown back then. Only in this case, he was locked down in a Roman prison. He says, chapter 4, verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you. And he goes on to say some remarkable things. He is in lockdown. He's separated from those he loves, his dear friends and so on. Uh, his fellow Christ followers, he's separated from them. And so what does he do? He doesn't send an email, doesn't lift, pick up the phone, which didn't exist. He writes a letter and he sends that letter. And that's the letter we have, the letter to the Ephesians. And what a letter it is coming out of his lockdown situation. And he talks about, uh, well, look, here I'm beside a beautiful church, our beautiful church at St. Luke's, Concord and Burwood, 162 years old, beautiful sandstone portions here, beautiful uh, stained glass windows and so on. Beautiful architecture, absolutely delightful built building. But what Paul in this chapter is going to do is he's going to warm our hearts and enthuse and kindle our, our spirits with a concept of church made out of living stones. The church, the real church, made out of people that God is putting together stone by stone, person by person, knit together in love and so on, as we'll find out in a second. And let's pray for a moment that God will give us, um, open our eyes uh, in our time of lockdown to a fresh view of church and all that God wants to do and is doing in his church. We pray. Our Lord, we ask that you would be with us as we look at your word today. Uh, open our eyes, move our hearts and move our wills to do what you would have us do and be what you would have us be. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. He begins in chapter 4 laying some foundations for church. I don't know how you find church, how well connected you are, how strongly connected you are with church, uh, and uh, uh, whether you've been part of a church for a long time, part of St Luke's for a long time, just new or still weighing it up. Um, here he paints a picture of what will be true of those who comprise the church. In fact, these are the sorts of people that Jesus builds his church out of. Uh, people who bear these things in mind. He says to these living stones, he says, um, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. He says, look, first of all, God calls. Now, I'm not just talking about being called to be a missionary or whatever you want to say. No, every person who comes to Christ has come as a result of being called. God draws people to himself. Uh, he opens their eyes to see the Lord Jesus. He opens our hearts to turn and uh, serve the Lord Jesus and follow him. He calls us. And what Paul says is, is, St. Paul says here, is that he wants us to live a life worthy of that calling, to live a consistent life, a life that's consistent with this calling that God has uh, called us with. And... He spells it out. In, in a church made out of living stones, or any group of people, in fact, but particularly in church, where we're called to have eternal relationships that will last for eternity, he says, first of all, be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. What Paul does is he prays that they might live consistently with the calling of Christ, and live lives that are like Christ. The one who was gentle and patient and who bear, bore with us in love, we need that sort of love to bear with each other. Now, I don't know how you find it getting on with other people in your family or in the church family, but he says it's going to require bearing with others. 
they're not always going to be agreeable. Uh, we are not always going to be agreeable to others. And so he says, in the living church, the true church, people will bear with one another in love. Here's the test. We don't just give up on each other or retaliate or bear grudges or keep resentments or uh, just keep each other at arm's length. No, we'll bear with one another in love. These, this is the, the substance of a real church, the living church that God is bringing together and equipping. And he says, look, I want you to be united. He says, make every effort to, be, uh, to keep the unity of the Spirit. God creates the unity amongst his people. People that come together, God calls together to be his church, uh, are given a unity. They're one in Christ. In fact, he says, there's one body, one spirit, verse 4, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And he's one, 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 one. And so he says, God has given us a unity. He's made us one. Now, uh, demonstrate that unity. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Are you a person that is a bit divisive? You're a person that's quick to take uh, offence. You're a person that perhaps um, gossips or, you know, just brings in a negative, has a critical spirit. Well, you've got to change. Paul says, look, that's got to change. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. That's the sort of attitude and spirit that God can bring to bear among us that will create a, a church that really does live up to its calling. Well, uh, in the Olympics that have been on as well, that have been given us a bit of um, pleasant relief from our lockdown, um, there's uh, a, some amazing solo sports. There's uh, the javelin and the, the swimming where it's not a relay. You do have team sports where it, like the relay or um, uh, where it, it's the sports, basketball or hockey or whatever it might be. Um, well, Christianity is definitely a team sport. There's no question that what's coming through here and what Paul is saying is this is a, not a solo sport. Being a solo Christian is a bit of a, you know, um, contradiction in terms. God is bringing Christians together. His goal is to be, to bring them together, to be a gathering, a living church, church made out of living stones. In fact, earlier, just back in chapter 3, he said this is where God will be glorified. He prays to God be glory in the church and in Christ. So God has a plan gather people to be his and to be glorified in their midst. And so this is one of the greatest team events. It is the greatest team event that we can participate in. And in the second half of the chapter, and we don't have time to do this justice, but he talks about how church operates. If it's going to uh, involve us living up to our calling, being gentle and patient, bearing each with one another in love and maintaining unity. If it's all of those things. And what happens is it's like a body that grows as each of its members do their part. It's a terrific picture, a terrific metaphor where Paul uses a body, a human body, arms and legs and head and, and so on to be an example of what church is. So it's a group, a, a body of people that where each one plays their part to, for the whole to grow. And this is enough to re-inspire us. It's probably a familiar passage to us. But just quickly, let's pick up on a couple of the key points. First of all, God equips his body of believers with gifts. He says that he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. And we know that in actual fact, everybody has a contribution from other parts of the New Testament. It teaches that everyone has a contribution, a gift. The Holy Spirit equips each of us to contribute. So do, don't underestimate how you can contribute to the life of your congregation, of the church. That's the idea of it, that we all play our part. He says, look, 
Um, it's held together by love. The, the members of this body are held together by love. Um, he says, speaking the truth in love in verse 15. And in verse 16, it builds itself up in love. If there's one thing that we pray and long for and strive for, is that our church will be a place, a group of people characterised by love. That when you gather or visit church, you experience love. It's a contradiction to have a church that's not loving or members of a church that are not loving. Here is a body that's just living on love. And then he says that it, it is a growing body. He says it's growing to maturity. It is a goal. It, it starts, you know, in a sense in infancy, but it, that's never designed to remain in infancy. He says, I don't want this to be a, a body that's, and he changes the metaphor, blown to and fro on the sea, tossed back and forth by waves because we're immature because we're an immature body that hasn't grown up. Rather, he says, the goal is that we will grow and build, out, build ourselves, the body up, until we become mature, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. The goal of church is that people will grow, individually, of course, but together we will grow to be more like Christ. And that's got to be constantly, brought back onto our agenda, our goal in coming to church, not just to go through a weekly cycle or, or some, some ritual or whatever it might be, but rather to keep growing to be like Christ and keep helping each other mature to all the fullness of Christ, as he says here, become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. That's the goal. And a good church will be a place where you feel like you're, you grow. You're growing to be like Christ. And you, you know that you're making your own contribution to that as you serve as well. Because that's the last point. Each one is participating and serving. In verse 12, um, what happens is God gave particular gifts to equip his people for works of service. It's not as if just God just gave ministers and evangelists and so on. Rather, he gave particular leaders uh, and partic those with particular gifts to equip everybody for works of service. This is not a situation where we just put on a couple of professional Christians to do the work. We know that's not how it works, but sometimes it, that's how we're, it, it defaults to. No. Constantly we remind ourselves that every member has a ministry. Every person in our church has a part to play. And sometimes it's in formal ways, you know, being on a Bible reading roster or whatever, but often it's informal, in conversation, urging each other on or sending a, a, a card when someone's in time of need or sharing a, a verse or an insight with someone over morning tea, whatever it might be. Uh, doing the journey together, building one another up, serving each other. Everyone has a part to play in this body, each one participating. At the Olympics, there have been a few beautiful moments where um, <clears throat> there's been this relationship across nations, uh, where despite the different nationalities, you know, athletes have hugged or congratulated one another or gone to console someone who just lost or uh, going to congratulate someone who won across the nations. One of the great things that's come through to us in the letters of the Ephesians is that in the church, we find that Jews and Gentiles back in their day, that was what it was up to about, Jews and Gentiles, very different groups of people would find unity in this living building. They found themselves knit together in love, in one body, even though they come from very different backgrounds. And here in chapter 4, we find how it works through Christ, his gracious forgiveness, his calling us into a body 
brings people of all sorts and conditions and backgrounds and types into one body, united in love, growing together to be like Christ. No wonder Paul prays, may God be glorified in the church. And that's our prayer too. Amen.